Ah, Cyrix, the scrappy underdog of the 90s CPU wars, the little chip maker that almost could, a company that burned brightly for a brief chaotic moment before Quake came along and sent it straight to Silicon Purgatory. But how did we get there? And why did Cyrix, despite some genuinely interesting products, ultimately crash and burn? Buckle up, because this is the tale of how a plucky semiconductor firm took on Intel, made some choices, and got fragged into oblivion. Our story begins in 1988 in Richardson, Texas, where a group of ambitious engineers led by Tom Brightman and Jerry Rogers decided that Intel shouldn't be the only one in town making x86 compatible processors. Enter Cyrix, a company that didn't actually build their own chips, but instead designed them and outsourced manufacturing to third-party fabs like Texas Instruments and IBM. It was a lean, mean operation, and at first, they weren't even trying to make CPUs. They focused on math coprocessors, those little sidekick chips that helped 386 and 486 processors crunch numbers faster. And they were good at it. Cyrix's coprocessors often outperformed Intel's own. But Cyrix had bigger ambitions. Why settle for being Intel's math tutor when you could be the professor? In the early 90s, Cyrix pivoted to making full-blown CPUs with the 486 SLC and 486 DLC. These were low-cost drop-in replacement for Intel chips, aimed at budget-conscious consumers and OEMs. They had cash on chip before Intel's own budget models did, and they actually performed decently for the price. Then came the Cyrix 5X86, which, if you squinted hard enough, could pass for a low-end Pentium. It was basically a souped-up 486, and for cash-strapped users, it was a way to extend the life of older motherboards without shelling out for a full Pentium upgrade. A clever move. But then, Cyrix got really ambitious. The 6X86, aka M1, was their shot at the big leagues. It was marketed as a Pentium killer, with raw integer performance that often did beat Intel's golden child. But, oh, and there's always a but, the 6X86 had a few issues. For one, it ran hot, like, please don't set your curtains on fire hot. And second, while its integer performance was stellar, floating point performance, so crucial for 3D gaming, was, as the kids say, dog water. And this is where our good friend Quake enters the chat. By 1996, gaming was changing. Doom had already proven that 3D was the future, but id Software's Quake took things to a whole new level with its fully 3D rendered environments. And unlike Doom, which could be brute forced with a decent CPU, Quake was heavily dependent on floating point calculations. This was bad news for Cyrix. See, the 6x86 looked competitive on paper because most benchmarks favored integer performance, and Cyrix chips crushed those tests. But Quake didn't care about integers. It wanted floating point muscle, and the 6x86 simply couldn't deliver. While Intel's Pentium and AMD's K5 held their own, Cyrix chips turned Quake into a slideshow. It was a death sentence in an era where gaming was a major driver of PC upgrades. It didn't help that Cyrix marketing had played up their CPUs as better than Intel's, which led a lot of angry customers realizing their fancy new processor was allergic to polygons. And gamers, oh, they remember. Once a CPU gets a reputation for being a gaming dud, it's game over. Poor Cyrix tried to fight back. The Media GX was an attempt to break into the low-cost integrated PC market, but it was more of a niche product. The 6x86MX, later called the M2, improved things a bit, but by then AMD had released the K6, and Intel was steamrolling ahead with the Pentium 2. Cyrix had one last gasp in 1997 when they merged with National Semiconductor, but it wasn't exactly a match made in heaven. National was more interested in embedding processors into cheap consumer gadgets than in duking it out with Intel and AMD. Cyrix, once a scrappy fighter, 
was now just a brand name slowly fading into irrelevance. By 1999, Via Technologies bought what was left, and Cyrix, as we knew it, was gone. So what's the takeaway here? Cyrix was this close to greatness. They had clever engineers, innovative ideas, and a real shot at disrupting the CPU market. But in the end, they underestimated the importance of floating point performance right when gaming and multimedia were exploding. And once gamers turned on them, there was no coming back. Still, Cyrix left its mark. It proved that Intel wasn't invincible, paved the way for budget-friendly alternatives, and in its own way, contributed to the cutthroat competition that gave us the diverse CPU market that we have today. Rip, Cyrix. You were weird, you were flawed, and for a brief moment, you made Intel nervous. And honestly, that's kind of sexy. So tell me, did you ever fall for a Cyrix chip? Did you get burned? Or maybe you have some fond memories of a 6x86 that got you through some long nights of not playing Quake. Let me know in the comments and don't forget to like, subscribe, and all that algorithm pleasing goodness. Until next time, keep your clocks high, your thermals low, and choose your partners wisely.